One of Python's major uses is as a scripting language, and a big part of system scripting is running external commands on your system. That's where the subprocess module comes in. It lets you run external commands, capture their output, and even interact with them directly from your Python code. By the end of this video, you'll be able to leverage the subprocess module to automate system tasks, handle command outputs, and even create child processes for more complex workflows. My name is Jake, and this is the Python Standard Library. The core functionality of subprocess revolves around running external commands. We achieve this with the subprocess.run function. What we'll pass into it for now is a list containing the components of some command, like get status, and when we execute it, it's going to hand us back a completed process object, which we'll store in result. For now, the only thing we really care about from this result object is the return code, which we can roll into a nice print statement. And if we run this, we see something interesting. First, we see the get status is actually printed out. And then we see the return code is zero, meaning that the command completed successfully. Now, if we executed the command incorrectly or the program itself encounters some type of issue, then we'd expect a non-zero return code. For example, if it changes from get status to something like get fake and run it again, we see git tells us that fake is not a git command, gives us some alternative options, and a return code is now one. Let's revert that change. And something common you'll see is people asserting on the return code being equal to zero or doing some type of conditional check before they proceed on with some type of action. We'll stick with the assert, let it run again, and everything's good to go. But we're not really doing anything with this git output, are we? Well, the good news is that we definitely can if we wanted to, but let's switch to a different example for that. And here we'll implement a log search script. So we have some example log here in a file called myprogram.log that has some example log entries. And what we wanna look for is specifically the errors in the log. Now, while we could just open this log file in Python and search line by line for this error text, that can be a bit slow, and especially so for very long log files. So what we'll do instead is we'll call subprocess.run, and this time the command that we're going to run is grep. We're going to pass in dash i to ignore case, searching for the word error, and we'll be searching in myprogram.log. And we're going to call split on that to convert that into a list. This way we don't need to manually break each component of the command into a list. We can just write it out as we normally would and then call split on it. Sometimes that's a bit more readable. And in order for us to capture the output, we need to pass in true to the capture output argument. Makes sense, right? And then we can just print out, found the following errors, give it a nice new line, and then result dot standard out. All right, let's run that and see what it looks like. Okay, so it did find those lines, but the output looks a bit ugly. We see that we have this B in front of the string, mean that it is encoded as a byte string. Well, there's a couple of different ways we can solve this. First, we can call dot decode on the string. And when we run it again, we see it breaks it out of that byte string. It decodes it into a normal string. And instead of printing out the new line characters here, it now gives us that pretty printing where it actually breaks it down into new lines themselves. So that looks a lot better. But there's another option. Instead of having to call decode on here, if we know we want to get text-like output out of this command, we can pass in text is equal to true, and then Python will take care of that for us. So we no longer have to explicitly decode. All right, that line's gotten quite a bit long, so let's go ahead and break this up to make it more readable. And there we go. We have a nice little script that calls grep to search our program log for errors. Okay, so far we've seen two ways to call commands with subprocess.run. We passed it in as a list. We've just specified it as a string and then split it out into a list. But what if we wanted to use some of the features we'd expect if running these commands in a terminal? Well, for that, we can still use subprocess.run, but this time we want to do something a little bit more fancy, like echoing some text into the end of myprogram.log. In order for us to do terminal-like things like redirection or piping 
or wild cards, we need to tell Python to use those shell features. And that'll basically execute this line, much like if you were to type that in the command line yourself. So let's give this a shot. We run add line, we get a return code zero, which looks good. And we can see that my program.log has been modified. And yeah, we have another log line there at the end. But be careful when you use shell is equal to true and never trust user input without validation if you're going to be using this because this is pretty susceptible to things like shell injection attacks. But if you're just writing your own script that you're going to be executing yourself, the risk of using shell is equal to true is minimal. Now, for most cases, run is all you need. However, there are a couple of other big things that this subprocess module offers that are definitely worth you knowing. And the first of these is subprocess.keyopen, short for process open. And this offers you a bit more control over those child processes. One big benefit of popen over run is that popen is non-blocking. This means that we can kick off multiple child processes and monitor them until they finish. So for these multiple processes, we're just going to do something simple like sleep for X amount of time. And much like run, we're going to call it with subprocess.popen. And then we're going to pass in some command. Of course, the command itself is going to be sleep. And then the argument is going to be however much time you want to sleep for. For example, here, if you wanted to sleep for five seconds, we would do it just like that. And you could use popen exactly how you see on screen right now. However, we want to run multiple at the same time. So what we'll do is we'll collect our processes in a list. Instead of each process sleeping for five seconds, we'll use the random module to give us a random integer. And we'll just give it a range of one to five. Okay, so that's our command, sleep, and then the amount of time that it's going to be sleeping for. And we're going to do this five times. So we're then creating five child processes. That's pretty easy, right? I mean, effectively, this is a single line just broken up for readability purposes, but we're creating five child processes in a single call. And if we run this now, it seems to exit immediately. Well, remember, this is a non-blocking operation. So even though it kicked off those child processes, we're not waiting for them to complete. So they're just running in the background. So how do we keep track of what's going on in each process? Well, there's a reason why I stored every process that we created in this list comprehension. And that's so we can do things like print each process ID. And let's actually make those plural. And then we can just print a message. And in here, we can use process.eid to give our process ID. Now, again, this won't wait, but it'll at least tell us the process ID that each of these start with. Okay, now let's move on to actually monitoring our processes. And for this, we're going to do a while loop. So while the processes list is not empty, we're just gonna print out real quick that we are checking the processes. We're gonna enumerate over our processes again. And since we're gonna making changes to the processes list in this for loop, we're actually gonna enumerate on a copy of the list. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to check to see if the process is completed by executing the whole method. And if that is equal to none, then we know that our process is still running. So we'll let the user know that. Again, we're going to use that PID. Otherwise, if poll returns anything other than none, we know that the process has completed. And once it's completed, we can go into our processes list and remove that process. Pretty easy, right? Next, we want to check to see if we still have processes. Then we're going to let the user know how many processes are still running and then give ourselves an extra line break for style. Now, finally, instead of running this constantly, we're going to sleep for a second because we know that these will be completing roughly every second or so, depending on the random numbers that they get. And at the very end, once we've escaped the while loop, we can print out that all processes have completed. All right, so here's our child processes script. First, we create the processes. So this kicks them off right then and there. Then we let the user know which processes have been started. And then we start monitoring the processes. We check that they're running with process.pull. If they've completed, then we've removed them from the processes list. Otherwise, we wait for about a second and then we repeat the loop over again until all have completed. Then we finally exit. All right, let's give ourselves some room and let it run. Beautiful. Look at that. 
we'll scroll back up. We see that the processes started with these IDs. We have five processes initially running past the first check, five still running in the second check. They're still running at the third check. By the fourth check, we have process four and five that have completed. Process two completes in the next check. And then finally, process one and two complete in the last check and all have completed. And since this is random, we'll get different results each time. Pretty easy, right? But we can take child processes a bit further by including pipes. So let's do that now. Okay, so in the previous example, we kicked off five child processes, right? And they all just executed on their own and wrapped up. But what if you wanna spin off child processes that need to communicate with each other? We can also do that with self-process.popen. So in this first one, we're gonna create a UV process. And this is gonna be subprocess again, dot p open. And the command we wanna run is UV Python list, which if we execute that in our terminal now, we see that it gives us a list of Python versions that are either installed on the system or are available to be downloaded by UV. So in this example script, I wanna take the output of this command, UV Python list, and pass it into another command to have it do some type of processing on it. And the way we're gonna do this is we're going to capture the standard output from this command in a subprocess.pipe. We'll then create a grep process, again with popen, and this will just be searching for 3.13 in that resulting output. Now how we're gonna pass these values into grep is to pass the output from our UV process into the input for our grep process. We can do this by saying standard in is equal to UV process dot standard out. Pretty simple, right? And then we'll also capture the standard out from this grep process in another pipe. Let's separate this a little bit to make it a little bit easier to read. And then finally, before we move on, I'm also gonna pass text is equal to true to this as well, because I do wanna get the output from that in a way that looks pleasant to me. Okay, and then for us to get anything out of it, capturing the standard out and standard error, and have them actually communicate with each other, we're going to call grep process dot communicate. And this will handle that back and forth between the two. And at the end here, we're going to print off Python 313 versions. Again, new line character here, and then standard out, and we should be good to go. All right, let's give a bit more room for this and let's run it. There we go. Really quickly, we see we have these Python 3.13 versions available. Really simple output, but in order to get there, we spun up two separate processes on our system, UV and grep, passing the output from UV into the input for grep, and then getting the output from grep and printing it out for the user. And that's pretty cool. But that brings us to the end of our exploration of the subprocess module and this stop on the Python standard library tour. You now have a powerful way to interact with your system from within your Python scripts. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing for more Python content. Let me know in the comments below what other modules you'd like to see covered in the future. And as always, thanks for watching.